This is Dr. Gerald Stucka. I'm the Extension Veterinarian and Livestock Stewardship Specialist here at North Dakota State University. I want to visit a little bit about some calf health issues that are somewhat unique to 2022. Just want to set this up a little bit by talking um, about some things that were unique to 2022. We had tremendous early spring summer forage growth and then the, the summer turned dry and so that had an impact on forage quality not necessarily so much on trace minerals uh, perhaps on vitamin A but what we see the impact was we saw perhaps lower weaning weights even decreased yearling cattle gains you know some of that due obviously to lower milk production by the dam and less quality forage for the calf itself so some of those things are a little bit unique to 2022 that we're not with us in 2021 where we had pretty much dry season all summer uh, just cut we're going to talk a little bit about bovine respiratory disease and what to expect i mean i expect that weaning calves on the ranch um, of your own place without bringing in new cattle that you'll certainly have less than one percent mortality and certainly less than five percent morbidity that's the goal zero is great if you can achieve it and then talk a little bit about what's preventable. We'll talk a little bit about multiple groups and commingling and related to uh, multiple pastures, the dietary change, and so on and so forth. So there's many things that go into weaning calves, not related necessarily to yearling cattle, but to weaning calves and what the stressors are and how they contribute to having a calf that's more susceptible to infectious disease. Then just a little bit about the unexpected. Sometimes we'll get respiratory outbreaks or even other outbreaks maybe related to pink eye foot rot or polio even that are later in the feeding period in backgrounding operations so those things that occur 45 to 60 days post weaning may be a brd outbreak but may be one of the others that we just mentioned and then we'll finally talk a little bit about about vaccination so what's important for me when i deal with these kinds of issues is to have a real history when I go into a herd that's and we'll just use this example a herd that's experiencing post weaning respiratory disease um, it's important for me to be able to visit with the people that are involved whether it's the veterinarian whether it's the owner the manager the herd person hired labor just need some kind of specific details related to the history of when it started and and then I like to be specific about the dates. Um, as I said earlier, when it started, uh, how many did you do treat? Uh, when was the commingling? When did commingling occur? What did you vaccinate with or not vaccinate with? How many treatments there were, and how many you had to retreat, and 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 perhaps even how many died. So the number of animals is always important. It's what we use as denominator. So how many animals did you treat? out of how many animals that we would consider at risk or how many animals were weaned. Um, and if there are several pens, how many animals in each pen and how many were treated in each pen by the number of animals in that, in that group. So I think it's important for us to visit a little bit about healthy animals and sick animals. I, I think that many of us can pick out a, an animal that's really ill but in order to be uh, very proficient at this and an expert at this, you need to know what a well animal looks like. And I think that's important as a starting point. So when I talk about wellness, we use some of these um, objective measurements like appetite. I mean, are they coming up to eat or not? Um, animals tend to be curious, uh, even animals that have a temperament that that uh, maybe puts them at the at the farthest limits of the pen or a quarter of a mile away there they still should be somewhat curious they should turn their head and see who's looking at them these animals in the upper right corner here have come right up to the feeding bunk and they want to know who you are and so it's an animal that is curious but there are other attributes as well like being bright-eyed I, I would attribute those animals to have being bright-eyed they they want to know you and want to 
see what's going on versus an animal that's we would say dull-eyed or exhibiting signs of non-interest that, that eye just looks different to the trained observer they should have a good hair coat they should groom themselves and others and as I said earlier they should be curious some of these other images in this picture in this slide demonstrate uh, cattle that have been shipped a long distance especially that one in the lower left there uh, a calf that came from the state of Alabama and came to the state of Kansas and it, the weather was not great for that animal it surely needed some tender loving care even though that animal itself was not that ill it just was in an environment that it was not uh, adapted to yet anyway until it got some good feed into them. the one on the on the right on that one is an animal that had been experienced a long haul a little tired you can't really tell so much for that image but those are all things you have in your mind as you're looking at animals do they look well or, or don't they I got a couple of pictures here and this relates to some terms that we use we use the term sign to indicate some type of objective measurement that things are not well uh, things like rectal temperatures we'll take a rectal temperature in an animal we want to see what it is if it's too high then we'll uh, come to the conclusion that there's something going on in that animal uh, there's some inflammatory response and it may or may uh, not need treatment in most cases we probably are going to treat an animal if we have what we believe is an elevated rectal temperature the other one is more related to symptoms um, a depressed animal um, it's more of a subjective term I guess than than an objective term like rectal temperature but the ADR there just stands for an animal that ain't doing right so uh, we consider that to be a indication that the animals not feeling well and you can see in these images here there's a couple animals that pen conditions aren't great either and that can make animals not real happy but these animals are experiencing more than just uh, poor pen conditions they're not feeling well and that should be obvious and and the question becomes should I've seen that animal the day before or two days before instead of noticing it just now on this date interestingly enough the animal in the lower right there has a what I would call a treatment tag and sometimes those treatment tags will be put in in some yards as an indication that they've been treated they may have a date on it they may have a notch on it to indicate uh, whether they've been treated once or twice so sometimes that's helpful in pens that are contain a large number of animals that so that it's not you're not confused by looking at an animal that was simply treated the, the day previously and then put back in the in the home pen so what do we consider to be normal in terms of rectal temperatures really normal is 101 and a half plus or minus a degree and but they can certainly be up to 103 and a half um, and still be normal you know depending on what the environmental temperature is like so um, I, I don't really have a hard and fast rule that unless an animal is 104 and higher that I'm gonna uh, treat that animal there's got to be some other symptoms involved as well and sometimes we can be confused by appearance animals with uh, longer ears that we don't see much up here in the northern plains but certainly in the southern plains we do uh, <clears throat> we call them eared cattle this image here is certainly one that has that animal has some boss indicus or brahmin response or uh, pedigree and the ears are a little bit longer and sometimes those ears take a little more energy just to keep upright and so sometimes you can be confused by a long-eared animal that the ears are down and you think it's depressed and so it, it takes some trained observation in addition to just running a, a fever to, to determine whether an animal needs closer inspection do I need to run that animal into the squeeze chute and actually have a look at it and determine whether I need to treat that animal with uh, perhaps with an antibiotic so there's many reasons and we talked about coming to the bunk as a sign of, of wellness and there may be other reasons why animals don't come to the bunk one of them may be simply water do they have access to water is there enough animals can drink at the same time so that they meet their water requirements or sometimes in the northern plains especially be very concerned with intake and animals not coming to the bunk if somehow something's wrong with the water whether it's frozen or whether there's actually electrical current in the water those animals will not drink and as a result they will not um, 
they will not eat either. So you'll have animals that are kind of shrunk up in the flank and, and evidence they're not eating. They may simply be shy. They're not very competitive. They don't come to the bunk. They're not, uh, they're not used to their other herd mate or pen mates or herd mates. And they're going to be the last ones to uh, come to the bunk. And sometimes there's not enough space for them all either. And so you have to account for that. And, and, simple, and, and lastly, they may have disease. They may not feel well enough to come to the bunk and eat some feed. This slide is, is a kind of a illustration of what happens in respiratory disease and why we kind of need to know some of the anatomy that you can't see necessarily when you're looking at it, certainly looking at a live animal and, the, and you can't really see these things even when you're doing an necropsy on an animal. But this is the respiratory system and how the airways work. We start up at the top of this illustration here with the trachea and then it branches off into smaller bronchi and bronchioles and you get down to the really small air spaces that we call the alveolar sac or alveolus and that's where exchange occurs where uh, cattle breathe off and uh, CO2 and that's where oxygen comes in through those alveolar spaces, alveolus, and the animal it gets oxygen. So when we have respiratory lung damage, then those air spaces don't work the way they should be or should, and animals can have certainly respiratory distress. They're not getting enough oxygen into their system. This is a very real <laughs> image of what it looks like when you have destruction of respiratory tissue. This is a picture of calf in which we retracted the, the uh, ribs. The head would be on the right end um, of this image. The, you can see where the liver and the, and the gallbladder is and, and the rest of the viscera back there. But this is a picture of lung tissue. There is um, there's not a great deal of good lung tissue here. Um, this lung tissue up here looks a little bit better, obviously then the tissue down here this looks more like the color of liver and and in, in spaces like this you're not going to really have any space in that lung tissue where uh, transfer of co2 and oxygen can take place so i've got an animal here that at least on this side of the lung there's maybe 50 percent of lung tissue that that actually works <clears throat> this is another slide and again the head is uh, would be on the right um, there's liver again. It's a little bit different picture. This is an image I got from the diagnostic lab at North Dakota State. Um, you don't really see any, any uh, what I would call <laughs> nice lung tissue here at all. It's reddened. There's certainly something going on here. And, and this one has actually had a couple of pathogens that were involved, BVD, bovine virus, diarrhea virus, and Mannheimia hemolytica. And, and what's interesting down here is it looks a little different down here. We've got a layer of, of what we call fibrin, which is an acute phase protein. And that acute phase protein comes into play in an animal's attempt to, to heal itself, to wall off the infection. And, and in this case, as you'll notice, this animal didn't survive. And so we've uh, got an, a lung tissue here that's basically non-functioning. This is a, a picture of uh, the upper airway. This is the trachea right here, the windpipe. And this is a calf that had what we call calf diphtheria or necrotic laryngitis. In some cases, it can be caused by the same organism that causes foot rot. In other cases, it could be caused by uh, Histophilus somni, for example, and even other organisms. But what, what the difference with a calf with calf diphtheria is how they sound because they're always going to make a lot of noise. So this is right in the vocal cords of this calf, this big lesion right here. <clears throat> and that causes the, the sound or the air that travels past this lesion to become very noisy. So if you got a calf, its head may or may not be distended, but he's really making a lot of noise. Uh, and he may be breathing fast. Usually that noise is coming from the vocal cords. It's not a sound that comes down deep 
into the lung tissue itself. So this one's a little bit different, and don't be fooled by it. And in many cases, these lesions, not one like this, obviously, but can be um, can be treated with an antibiotic very successfully if you if you deal with them uh, early enough. <clears throat> Here's one that's a little bit different. Um, let me just use my marker here again. We've got a calf again that the head is on the right over here. Uh, here's lung tissue, here's gallbladder, these are intestines back here. So this lung tissue up here looks fairly normal. Um, there's still spots in here that are not, but we've got some liver colored looking things down here. Um, you know, this is probably less than 50% of lung tissue that's viable. It's dark, it's red. And what you see uniquely down here is what looks like little white pimples almost, if you will. And that would be pretty typical of a calf that has mycoplasma pneumonia. Those calves tend to be very difficult to treat. They don't always exhibit real strong signs of being ill. The rectal temperatures may not always be that high. Uh, it's more of a chronic type of infection, infection I should say. And these, what these are, these little white lesions here in the lung tissue. They're actually small little abscesses in the lungs. And obviously this calf can't get enough air oxygen transfer and CO2 transfer as well. So it's succumbed to that uh, mycoplasmal organism that, that was in its lungs. Sometimes as a sequelae to mycoplasma pneumonia, we actually get mycoplasma arthritis. This is a knee of a calf, the hind limb of a calf that has arthritis. And as I opened up this this calf, this will change colors here. This, um, this is actually pus in the joint of a calf. It's a dried pus. We sometimes use, use the term inspissated pus, but it, nevertheless, it's a sign that tremendous inflammation for mycoplasma in the joint of the calf. And those are extremely difficult to treat, as you might expect. And uh, so this calf not only had pneumonia, but it metastasized into the lungs as well. Difficult treatment. Just want to follow up that with a little bit of a comment about mycoplasma. This was a study that was done a number of years ago by at that time Pfizer Animal Health and <clears throat> this study was never written up but I, it was important and I gleaned some information from it as it relates to mycoplasma. So what they did in this study they took in high-risk calves and they had like 10 groups uh, 60 calves in each group, and I just picked one here primarily. Um, but they would take deep nasal swabs of these calves every 10 days or so. In this, in this, it was day zero, they took a swab, day 10, day 21, and then went out to day 28, and then again at day 60, just to look at what pathogens they could isolate, at least bacterial pathogens from the deep nasal swabs. And so, I want to focus on Mycoplasma bovis here and, and its illustration of how rapidly that organism can spread within a population. So on, on day zero, I had, I don't know, somewhere around maybe 5% or less, maybe even just a couple of animals that were positive. But by day 10, I had 75% of those animals that were now positive on culture from deep nasal swabs. The difference between these groups is that in this study, it was, a, it was an antibiotic study where they gave antibiotic. And so you're starting with kind of the same number of positives, really low positive. By day 10, we had a little over 50%, but then by day 21, we hit 75%. The only takeaway here is that while the antibiotic didn't stop the spread, it somewhat slowed it down a little bit. So at least you might uh, gain some, some element of time in trying to manage these cattle a little bit better, at least as it relates to Ambovis. And, and we kind of see some of the other organisms here. The, the deep, the dark green is Mannheim hemolytica, the gray is Pastorella multacida, and this, this uh, kind of dark purple or, or dark blue line is H. somni. What I find interesting on H. somni is later on after arrival is when H. somnus seems to uh, start coming into play. A couple comments on mycoplasma vaccine. I'm not a big proponent of it. Um, I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, science that tells me that it works the way it's supposed to work. 
Um, so this first bullet points are just on a, on a killed vaccine for mycoplasma bovis and didn't really see evidence of efficacy on either on ear infections or respiratory disease. There is a new mycoplasma vaccine. It's being marketed by Zoetis. It's a modified live vaccine, which is how, what I've felt for some time that we probably needed in order to have some effectiveness against this organism. I don't really have any peer-reviewed literature to, to uh, talk about in, in regards to this vaccine. Uh, so we'll need to kind of uh, discover perhaps for ourselves what the efficacy really is on, on this particular vaccine. You know, whether giving it on arrival in high-risk animals is really going to be effective or not. It's currently labeled to be used in cattle uh, one week of age or older against respiratory disease. And duration of immunity has not been established. I use, I'm going to use this example of some of the times the things that come into play that have very little to do with vaccination and more to do with management than anything else. This was a, an email that was sent to me a number of years ago from someone in Georgia who wanted me to comment on a vaccine protocol uh, that they used in bull test uh, station. Um, it says, concerning a vaccination protocol sent to the bull test years ago by someone at the vet school in Athens, Georgia, incoming bulls must be vaccinated two to three weeks prior to our arrival with IBR, PI3, BRSV, BVD1 and 2, Manheimi, Hemolytica, Pastorella multacida, now Histophilus somnus instead of Haemophilus, it's called Histophilus somni, and Clostridial seminoi. So, I mean, the idea here is correct to try and immunize animals against certain pathogens, at least a fair amount of time before the stress of movement and, and other uh, stressors come into play. And then at processing, which means they've arrived at the bull test station, the boosters will be given using whatever vaccines some companies will donate. A little more history with this one. Typically processing is in around July 5, which would be different than our bull test stations up here. but. And the bulls are sold around December 7th. Within a seven to 10 days after arrival, there are numerous cases of BRD, which are treated, may be retreated, and the process really runs to late November. It, and the question was if the protocol pre-arrival and at processing was an intranasal vaccine, that's the acronym IN, like TSV2, or we could use nasal gin or um, N43, and an intramuscular or subcutaneous Manheimia hemolytica pastoral multocida vaccine plus clostridial omitting the hemophilus or histophilus, would there be less BRD? I would appreciate your advice. The answer is no. Uh, unequivocally, no. It's not going to make any difference what you vaccinate these cattle with because what you're dealing with here is the impact of commingling. When you bring a bunch of bulls in, and I don't know exactly how they pen these bulls, but usually they're penned by breed when they come in. And they almost never have them penned by owner. If or not, and I don't know whether they were committed to having three bulls or five bulls or less or more or more, sometimes one bull. They're going to have commingling occur. And that's really what's going on here. So somehow management needs to change as to how they pen these bulls and how they're handled within the early arrival period because they'll continue to have respiratory disease unless they deal with the commingling effect. Now, I'm leaving out any comment about nutrition. Usually in bull test stations, they strive for high average daily gains, and that can play a role in putting a little extra stress in these animals and resulting in perhaps respiratory disease as well. So in summary, I just want to talk about a few issues here, and I've used the term prevent the preventable. And I spend a little bit of time talking about the factors that, the stress factors that result in calves becoming ill after weaning. And one of those was commingling, and that's why some of my recommendations reflect that management strategy to prevent commingling uh, once the, at the same time the calves are weaned. So feed all the groups of cows and calves together prior to weaning, if possible. When you do that, it allows the calf to getting used to eating a ration. It may be off the ground. It may be in bunks, depending on herd size. And you don't necessarily have to feed the exact same ration, but some of the components will be the same as what uh, you're going to use once the calf is separated from the mother. So 
when you do that and you do that for two weeks or three weeks thereabout, it removes because the, the pecking order, the social <laughs> life, if you will, becomes reorganized and that commingling stress becomes reduced. The only time when I've seen it not work is when you've got groups of cows and calves together, but the, the space is so large. In other words, a section of ground, for example, and you're feeding in two different sp spots in that section of ground, then commingling doesn't occur even when they're with their mothers. So make sure that all these cows and calves are being together and you're feeding them, them in, in one place. In addition to that, just observe these calves for signs of wellness. Are they acting normal? Are they curious? Do they groom each other? Uh, are they bright eyed? And of course, uh, when you're walking the pens, and, and it's important to walk the pens, uh, it's important to have a, kind of the same person or maybe two people that trade off, but walk these pens so the calf gets used to who you are and you're used to those calves and how they behave. But you need to observe for wellness, but also observe the manure. Is it too runny? Is it bloody? A runny might indicate that the calves are taking in too much energy. They may be acidotic. If it's bloody, the calves may be exhibiting signs of coccidiosis. We will use ionophores in many cases to prevent coccidiosis. We also use them because they help cattle make uh, use of feed in a more efficient manner. But there are specific products that are coccidiostats as well, like decox or decoquinate and, and amprolium. Sometimes we'll use them in our weaning rations as well. When you have calves that are breaking with coccidiosis and you're feeding these products and the break occurs before approximately day 21, that means that there, the infection occurred before uh, before you were able to put in some of these coccidiostats. Now, decox can work in, in different ways, but especially in the ionophores. Because the life cycle of coccidiosis is about 21 days, when they occur after 21 days, you know that some of those calves are not getting the right amount. It may, may be related to intake. It may be related to the inclusion rate that uh, you have in that ration. In terms of vaccinations, uh, the virus vaccines we use today are very good. They slow the spread of transmission. They diminish the signs of illness from the viruses themselves. So they, they work and they're efficacious. Some of the bacterial pathogens I'm a little more skeptical of. On Menheimia hemolytica, there's some evidence that it limits lung damage. Pastorella multocida, Histophilus somni, in my mind, there's limited scientific evidence for their efficacy. I don't try and talk people out of it necessarily. I don't necessarily recommend their use, but if they use them, and I'm not saying we don't need vaccines for those pathogens. It's just that um, we may need a different technology to, um, to evaluate the efficacy of some of those vaccines in the future. Mycoplasma bovis, the same. I have, there's limited scientific evidence for efficacy. There is a new one on the market, Protivity, and I really don't know a great deal about that particular vaccine to uh, recommend it at this stage. So thank you for listening. Uh, I hope this was helpful. And remember that uh, the specialists are here to help in any way we can. So don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you so much. Thank you.